Welcome to Products That Count, her first event in January. Thank you for coming out. I know in a very, it's a very cold evening, but um, you're here. We have a great speaker, so we're very excited to have everybody here. How many here have been to a Products That Count event before? How many first time? It's a good mix. So products that count. So we're new to New York. This is our. This is only our sixth event. It started in the Bay Area. Um, we're about let's see, seventeen thousand product managers strong, which is exciting. Uh, like I said, started in the Bay Area. We are expanding to Silicon Valley in San Jose, soon in Seattle, and then we're also here in New York City. Um, Products That Count is really a great resource for product managers, innovators, entrepreneurs, et cetera. And what we're really hoping is to grow the product community here. Um, we're not like the Bay Area, fair, but we're not small either, and we're thriving, and we're all passionate about product. So that's what we're hoping to do here. Um, we have a monthly speaker series like this. Uh, we have newsletters, podcasts. We also do um, executive retreats. So if you're not on our newsletters, well, now you will be because you've, you're, you're here. Um, so keep your eye out. We, do, we, we really have a great program planned for 2018. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, first I want to thank Digital Ocean for this great venue. They supplied our food, our drinks, and this awesome space, so thank you so much. And also two of our wonderful um, partners, Amplitude and M Particle. I think we're supposed to have some people from M Particle tonight, but I'm not sure if they're here. All right, well, I want to introduce Sharon. So our speaker tonight is the CPO at General Assembly. He was formerly the SVP of product at Weight Watchers. He's going to be talking about how to build products for humans. Please give a warm welcome to Sharon Vijasingham. And um, yeah, let's give him a big, big round of applause. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? All right, cool. I'm going to do a stopwatch because I will probably run a little bit long. Um, Thanks for rallying and coming out tonight. I know it's a little crappy this morning. Um, I don't know if you need to cover this. We'll skip right through it. All right. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you today about uh, building products for humans. So very generous introduction uh, from Andrea. I'm the chief product officer at General Assembly, which if you have not heard of General Assembly, it is a digital education and assessments company. And we can talk more after about it. So uh, I just want to get a kind of pulse. How many people here are product managers? Half the room. How about engineers? Got a couple. Product designers? Data analytics folks? No data people? Oh, interesting. Uh, anyone else in any other function? What was that? Sorry? OK, cool. All right, so some of you may be wondering uh, why I'm talking about building products for humans, because that's what you do in your day jobs, right? So um, a tiny bit of background. So obviously, where I've worked, um, and it's a little hard to read, but um, the common theme that you may see in all these companies that I've worked for uh, and product teams that I've led is it's inherently about helping people, um, and they're very human brands. So a lot of the product experience actually happens outside of the confines of an app screen, right? whether it's a web app or a mobile app. Uh, and you can obviously see I like to work for companies with two letters in their name. That's just the thing I do. So, I love this quote because um, Seth Godin talked about it in his blog. It's from an article called Counting Beans. Uh, the general premise is if you take a bowl of bean soup and you take out one bean, it'll probably save you a little bit of money. Probably won't notice a difference. You could keep doing that and keep saving money, but at the end of the day, you're going to end up with a pretty flavorless broth. Uh, and so he says organizations that keep adding to the experience will always win out over those that don't, uh, which is sort of what I want to talk a bit about today. So. Um, how many people have used a rideshare app of some kind, Uber or Lyft, yeah? So you've probably seen a screen like this, right? Pretty straightforward, you pick your destination, maybe you choose the kind of car you want, driver shows up, you get in, you get to your destination, maybe you rate, maybe you do a tip, right? But you've all probably experienced this moment, right? Where the app swears that the driver's right there and you're trying to figure out where the person is. And you get on the phone with them, they're like, oh, I'm at the CVS, no, I'm at the Starbucks, I'm in the right corner, just stay right there, I'm gonna find you. Uh, and that moment right there, before you get in the vehicle, is this moment of micro friction, right? And I will talk a bit about that micro friction. Um, another example, anybody use grocery delivery of any kind? Yeah, okay, so we use Fresh Direct, right? 
place an order, try to get the produce in before I leave for work because I don't want it sitting out there all day. Um, I get a text that says it's showing up between five and six. Six o'clock rolls around, no sign of groceries. I wait a little bit, call customer service, say, hey, what's going on? They have no idea, right? I'm on a route, but they can't tell me much more than that. So I have to just wait. 6.35, I get this text that says, hey, you're next. And I don't know if that means I'm two minutes next or I'm 30 minutes next, right? And so the final order shows up almost an hour after my delivery window. And so in that moment, for that hour, I've had this friction. I've just been trying to figure out, like, where is my stuff, right? I'm just trying to figure out where this is. Another example, so I bank with Citibank. Uh, Citibank has you create your online profile with your debit card number, which on the face of it kind of makes sense, right? It's a second factor of authentication. It's a way to verify you. Um, all well and good until you lose your wallet. So I lost my wallet. I called them up, said, hey, I lost it. What can you do? They say, okay, great. We'll cancel your card. We'll issue you another debit card. Sounds good. Then I go online, right? Because logically, I want to move all my money aside, just to make sure nothing's happening. My profile is locked out, right? There's nothing I can do. So I call them back. They say, yeah, it's locked out because it was tied to your debit card. And now that we've canceled your debit card, it doesn't work. OK, kind of makes sense. Can you move this money for me? There's absolutely nothing they can do. They say, you have to go to a bank branch. And this is about 5 PM. There's no way I'm going to make it to a branch. So I've got to wait till like 9 AM the next day. And so this whole night, I'm wondering what's happening. Again, a moment of this friction, right, as I switched. A couple of examples from my past. So, uh, Weight Watchers, I'm going to oversimplify, but it sells basically an online-only product where you can consume it in the app or a meetings-based product where you can go physically to a meeting room. Um, and a lot of folks make mistakes when they're buying it. They, they end up picking the wrong product. And so someone who picks an online product and walks into a meeting room uh, is going to be greeted with a receptionist that says, hey, there's nothing we can do for you picks up the phone and hands them the phone to talk to customer service, where in that moment, they now have to essentially cancel and rebuy. And if you think about the psychology of something like Weight Watchers, they've, take, they've crossed this pretty big hurdle to say, hey, I'm going to do something about um, this lifestyle change I want to make. And in that very first moment when they've walked into this meeting room, they failed at the first task that, right, to buy the right product. So it creates this moment that says, I bought the wrong thing, a friction in that moment. Last example from my past also. Uh, so I worked at College Board. I don't know if you know what College Board is, but they make the SATs. Everyone heard of the SATs? Yeah? OK. So one of the things you do with the SATs is you register for it a few months ahead. And one of the things you get when you register is this thing called an admissions ticket, right? It's basically what um, they use to compare you to um, the person that's coming to take the test and make sure it's the right thing. Um, what often happens, though, so I've sat in in some of these test centers and observed them, is you've got these parents and these kids who said, I forgot to bring this printout, right? And in that moment, they believe this is the moment that's going to decide the rest of their lives, what college I'm going to go to, what jobs I'm going to get as a result. And in that moment, that one piece of paper that they forgot has created so much friction for them. So I call this mode shift friction, right? It's the friction that occurs when you shift between one context diffuse to another, whether it's a buying context to a using context. It's the friction that exists when you shift from one channel to another channel. It's the friction that exists when you switch from one mode of use, different mode of communication, right? This is mode shift friction. Now, it's not all bad, right? And I want to stress these are great companies that are doing a lot of great things. It's just if you're not paying attention to these shifts, you will end up with these situations. So here's some great examples. How many people know what this is? Decent show of hands? OK. So this is a magic band from Disney, which essentially is an RFID bracelet, right? And so one of the things uh, Disney does is when you visit their parks, they store a whole bunch of information on this RFID bracelet. It lets you open doors and get to rides and cut the line and all sorts of good stuff. But one of the other things it does is it loads the name of your kids who are visiting Disney onto this device. And so when your daughter goes up to a favorite Disney character, the character knows her name, right? It greets her by name and says that. And in that moment, there's this magical moment, which is what Disney is all about, is creating these magical moments. Now, if you think about what Disney was doing, this was a data collection device for them, right? They want to see how many people are going to their park, what rides are they using, where are they going, what are they doing? But they went the extra mile to create a magical user moment out of that experience. They were thinking specifically about how to use this. Another example. So I use Amex. I bought some tickets for an international trip last year in February. Uh, I, bought, I didn't use Amex Travel, right? I just bought it on a travel site. And 
fast forward to June, which is when I'm traveling, you run through the checklist of things you've got to do. One of the things I want to do is I'm going to call and figure out if I can let them know I'm traveling so they don't lock out my card. About a week before I traveled, I got this email from them that says, hey, you don't have to call us. We've noticed from your travel details, we know where you're going, it's international, what your dates are, you don't have to call us, right? And so they anticipated this need I had, and I did not have to call. And I don't know about you, but when I call for this kind of thing, I usually end up calling twice because I have to call a second time, trust but verify, to make sure they actually got the information. So I saved two calls. And if you think about it from Amex's perspective, though, they saved all this money because now they don't have someone on the other end taking these calls from everyone who needs to travel internationally. They've anticipated this need, and they've saved themselves money in the process. Last example. So I take my car to a dealership to get work done. Um, typical process is I drive up, I go upstairs to the waiting area, and then I start working. You know, I'm doing some email, I might take a conference call, I might work on a presentation. Um, and so I'm doing all this stuff. And usually somebody will show up when they're done, and it's usually in the most inopportune moment, like right in the middle of the time when I'm actually speaking on the call, or I'm like in my flow, writing something, doing something. And so what they did was they switched to the system where as soon as they closed out the record, they finished working on the vehicle, they sent this automatic notification to me. And so for me, that's great because I'm on this call, I can see this thing come through and I say, okay, fine, I'm gonna find the right moment, you know, mute the call or turn off video and go downstairs, pay for it, do all this good stuff. But it's also helpful for them because now the person, the service tech, isn't waiting for me up in the waiting room. He's moved on to the next car, right? And their throughput's a lot faster. So there's a business benefit to it. So find a good point to stop in that journey. So did you notice the pattern in there? The pattern is, there's a benefit to the business at all points of this journey while they're thinking about creating a great experience, right? And that, that's the point I wanna underscore um, a lot because when you're building products for humans, it doesn't have to be an and or, right? It's great that they built a great product experience for a person, but that doesn't come at the expense of creating value, generating value for your business. And that's what we're gonna spend a bit of time today talking about how we create that. So how do we fix this? How do we fix mode shift friction, right? I'm gonna take a tiny detour because I think this is something that people have attempted to solve a number of times. Uh, and I think really good examples of things, these are, are um, incredible ways to start solving it, but I'll talk about what the challenges I have with them. So um, service design goes all the way back to 1984. Um, a bank executive by the name of G. Lin Shosak, he wrote an article in Harvard Business Review about how to improve processes in a bank, right? And so they came up with an artifact. This is a more contemporary version, but a service design blueprint, a service design map that talked about all the parts of the service. There's front stage, backstage, and all of these components, right? Then a little bit later, right, so late 90s, um, this company Amtrak was building their new Acela train line. Uh, and so they called IDEO. You guys have heard of IDEO, right? Big design firm. They called IDEO and said, hey, we need help designing the armchairs that will sit in this train. And so IDEO does what IDEO typically does, and they sat and they started to observe people buying and purchasing and getting on the train. And what they found was that the train purchasing journey started eight steps before somebody actually sat in the seat. And so to map that out, they created a journey map. And this is, again, a more contemporary version of a journey map. It has you know, the emotional stages of the user and the journey across each of the different processes in there. And then the most sort of recent evolution, although it's coming up on a decade ago now, um, Comcast had you know, a video game platform in Canada and they were trying to deepen the relationship with gamers. And so they worked with this company called Enforms and Enforms came up with experience maps, right? Which focused a little bit more on the persona of a user. And so this again, a more contemporary example. These are intentionally not super clear for one reason. I wanna point out what I think is a critical flaw with all of these. So it's a function of how they exist, right? They're trying to fit a lot of information into one document. And they all seem to have a particular pattern, right? So you notice these like horizontal swim lanes that appear, right? They might be between front stage, backstage, or it might be between different channels, right? And they all take a linear path, right? And so you've got these blocks, they're process blocks, they're steps, they're functions, they're pieces of the journey. Uh, and some versions of them have, you know, circles, but they're still sort of linear journeys. And the problem with the linear journeys and these swim lanes is that they create these lines that separate the process. It's well and good in a document this size. But then as individual teams, as you all start to go solve for a specific use case, you're zooming in really small into one of these use cases. And so as every team does that, these lines start to create these rifts. And these are the rifts that we don't think about consciously, but they create mode shift friction. 
And so that's what I want to spend a bit of time today, is talking about how we think about the consumer um, consumption journey with all of our products, right? And then how we can solve for mode shift friction. So to introduce that, I want to talk about the product experience loop. So your mileage may slightly vary, but most of us, I posit, will have some flavor of channels, right? So you've got web-based consumption or software. You may have a smart device solution, an in-home smart device like a smart TV or uh, an Alexa or an out-of-home smart device like digital signage. You may have a mobile app. You may have a retail presence of some kind, right? You may have a store. You may have a distribution center. And then you have methods of communication. So you've got an email channel that you have inbound and outbound, promotional and inbound. You may have conversations that are happening, right? Live conversations or conversations on an external site, a review site about your brand that you may not have information about. Um, there may be phone conversations. Your customer may have an inbound conversation to you. You may be making some outbound sales calls. There may be chat, right? It may be SMS, maybe chatbot. Now, the thing to remember, though, is that your user just does not care that there is the VP of something or other over here and the director of something other over here. They don't care that these are disparate channels. They don't care about the complexity of your organization. From their perspective, they're interacting with your brand. And so every one of these touch points, they have aggregated that experience, but you may not be seeing it. So it probably ends up looking like these touch point dots that exist where there's siloing of data that's happening. And what you would hope to be a completely clean loop isn't a completely clean loop. And so at every one of these points, right, there's, I've illustrated some ways that you could have leakage of that data. And so solving for mode shift friction, the next five steps are about getting to this comprehensive view for how we want to bring it all together. So there's five steps that I propose to solve mode shift friction. And I'll talk about some examples of what that's done for us. So these are the five steps. I'm going to go through each of them in great detail. Right. Step one, find your gaps. Identify those big moments in the journey of your product experience that create this. Right. Here's how you can do it. So you can take an existing, you may have a journey map, you may have a service blueprint, you may have these artifacts in place. If you don't, that's OK. Right. Because you can always sketch this. It's not super complicated. Each one of you can go start sketching the big blocks in that journey. Then review them as a collective team. And by team, and I asked the question about who here was not from a product team. Team isn't just the product team. Team is anyone who's customer facing, right? You may have a customer service team. You may have a sales team. You have a marketing team. You want to integrate that team and start collectively going through your flows or your maps and start to circle those gaps. You may find some of them are about channel shift, right? So you want to identify some gaps in the channel shift. Some of them may just be time duration from one mode, one context to the next. You may start circling these. And then this is the critical part. You want to name one person in the product org, and ideally one person who is part of the organization that's servicing that, to be the stewards. They don't own it, but they have to be responsible for it. Because if you don't have someone responsible for that, it's just never going to go anywhere. right? It's always going to get second shift. Step two, you want to start capturing data. Right? So capturing the gap data. You have software systems. You want to instrument them. And they may be software platforms that you've built. They may be commercial off-the-shelf software that you want to just turn on some instrumentation for. And you want to start to deploy some methods to collect this data. Right? So you've taken this view. You've created your circles. Now you want to try to ex review your existing data sources. Do you already have data that sits in a CRM system? Do you have data that sits in an email system? And start to think about pulling those together. So one of the exercises we did uh, at General Assembly is we had you know, all these disparate systems. Uh, and connecting all that data, initial version was like all being loaded into a data warehouse. And that's incredibly complicated. And we switched to, and I'll talk about it in step five, a mode of collection where we implemented um, Snowplow, which is an open source analytics platform, to just instrument every step of that journey. And we started with software, and we moved all the way through um, all the different experiences. So review the existing data you have. You may already have data that you have that you can use. And if you don't, you're going to start collecting them. You want to start to identify what things you need to instrument. Right? Do you need to turn something on? Do you need to add some analytics code to a page? Do you have research methods that you need to employ? Right? Is it surveys? Is it collective story harvest? Right? Tools that you can deploy to start to gather the information qualitatively and quantitatively. And then obviously plan and roll out. Right? You've got to fit that into the, I'm sure, body of other work you've got to do. Um, you've got to figure out how to do that. Now, if you don't have a dedicated user research team, because that comes up from time to time, right? If we run lean teams, we may not have a person. Get the whole team out there. Get everyone talking to and shadowing your customers. You'll start to see some patterns emerge. 
in the core parts of the behavior. And that's, again, where collective story harvests are incredibly helpful to sort of aggregate the perspectives of all the different customer-facing teams in your organization, right? So that's step two. Step three, track those shift triggers. Figure out the events that are gonna drive that shift in mode. What do I mean, what do I mean by that, right? So you've circled all these spots. You've probably got a starter list of things that you may know, right? Your customer service team says, hey, these are the five drivers of call volume. These are the things we wanna to start to look for. You wanna to start to look for patterns in your behavior, right? So look for patterns that drive a mode shift. What happens before the call? What drives people to click contact us? What do you see in terms of duration, time of day? When are people contacting more often? You wanna look for the patterns in the data that are gonna help you then prioritize. And there's three dimensions that you're gonna prioritize on. You're gonna prioritize on user value first, right? How does this solve a user need? You're gonna prioritize on business value. Does this create opportunities? Is this saving us cost in some way? Does this create new revenue streams for us? And then obviously effort, right? Because if it's something that's easy to do, you wanna do it quickly. Uh, and if it's something that's complicated to do, you don't have to. You'll start to circle these and identify priorities on each of these circles, right? And you'll say, okay, these are the things we need to tackle first. Now, one thing to keep in mind is you're gonna to wanna to combine the qual and the quant data, right? And here's why you should do that, because you may have something that quantitatively looks like a really big problem, but if you actually look at the qualitative data behind it, it may not be driving as much dissatisfaction as something that may be quantitatively smaller, but is actually a big driver of dissatisfaction. So you may wanna combine those data sources as you think about prioritizing these shift triggers. Step four is pretty obvious, right? You've identified it, you've started to tag it, you've started to prioritize it. Start fixing that friction, right? Start thinking about how you wanna plan and execute those solutions for those priorities. So the same view, um, if you think about a prototypical team, right? Let's think about a team that's set up around sign up flows and forgotten password flows. Their domain, their remit might be all of the screens, all of the supporting forgotten password emails, et cetera. But you may find in looking at your data that call volume goes up, right? When you kick off a bunch of forgotten password screens because people aren't getting the email or they're not able to do the resets themselves. You may want to expand the scope of that team or you might say, hey, your metrics now include call volume around this particular issue and how you can drive those down. You may have a problem that's big enough in scope that you don't want to necessarily expand. You may want to actually just have a dedicated team and you want to prioritize a team on that. Now, you may have to trade some off, right? You may not have the ability to spin up a brand new team and you may say, we're gonna stop doing this thing in order to focus on this one thing. And you know that it's important and valuable to do because you've prioritized the user value and you've prioritized the business value. So it's easy to make a business case for that. And so an example for this, um, for General Assembly was, you know, somebody would sign up for um, a class online or they'd sign up and request a lead online. We process that information, kick it over to our sales team and the sales team would make an outbound call, right? And so we were getting really low um, call response rates. And so then we started talking to some folks and what they ended up saying was, I'm applying for a GA class while I'm at work. And so when you call me when I'm at work, I'm probably not gonna talk about this thing that I'm doing. Uh, and so we tested a few options and we switched to texting, right? So as soon as they responded, our admissions or our sales team would reach out to them with a text message and then we saw response rates just climb through the roof, right? And so that's how you can think about identifying these moments and expanding the remits of those teams. And then obviously make a plan and execute on that. You may wanna test some solutions, um, but you can start to plan out how you might solve these. And then the one thing I want you to think about is the, the solution may not be a software product solution, right? The solution might actually be an email modification. The solution might be a change to a workflow rule in your CRM system. It may be a new call script that responds to a particular issue uh, when someone's calling in. So you may want to think creatively about how you can fix this friction in the context of the whole company, not just in product teams. And the final stage of the evolution, right, you've, you've gone through steps one through four and you've repeated it a couple of times, is you wanna to try to connect all of those user interactions. So if you think about that loop, right, that I shared, you wanna be able to have a linked experience for every part of that journey. And so I, I mentioned Snowplow when I started talking about that. So we started Snowplow implementation, which was basically like software events, right? When user clicks on something, user moves through a screen. We then extended it into our A-B testing platform, right? So all of our data we use Optimizely, and so all of our Optimizely data flows right into Snowplow. Uh, we're now extending it into our CRM and our telephone system. So we now have the ability to capture um, CRM level data uh, and call volume data. And, and call volume data, you know, 
is interesting because you, you can think about metrics that might get lost, like how long someone's sat on hold before they talk to you, right? Your data may not show you that right off the bat, but that's the kind of stuff you want to start thinking about. So flag the gaps, right, as you start to think about linking this data um, so everyone can get access to it. Now, I realize that it's kind of lofty to say, like, yeah, sure, like, connect all your data, right? That's not always practical. And so one of the things you want to think about is giving different teams access to systems, right? And I'll talk a bit about um, how you can think about giving teams access. But if you think about a customer service team, if you gave them access to some of the product analytics that they don't otherwise have, might they be able to do their job a little better? If you think about a sales team, if they had some of the metrics on how people are navigating through a purchase funnel, might they be able to do their job better? So think about giving people access to data that it already exists, even if you can't link those systems. You are probably going to find some gaps in your data, and you're going to want to flag those, and you want to track them and make a plan to fix them. Uh, and then the most important thing, though, is to continue that dialogue, is to continue the conversation not just within product, but with all of your customer-facing teams, because that's what's going to sort of surface these things. And as you start to close this loop, you're going to start to be able to anticipate these triggers before they actually even happen. Right? You're going to see patterns that are starting to emerge before you've identified them and start to create the solutions for them as you go. So I promised in the uh, intro spiel um, that I would give you something practical that you could do in your next sprint. So I know it sounds conceptual and it sounds big and it says, yeah, that's great. Like maybe we can do this in 24 months, right? Here are things that you can do in your next sprint. Uh, you can do them tomorrow if you want to break your sprint too. Um, it wouldn't stop you. So step one, find your gaps. The first thing you can do is go gather. If you've already got sketches or flows or journey maps of some kind, gather them, right? If you don't, start sketching them. Each one of you can go and start to draw the blocks, right? You can get your whole team together and do a design studio exercise where you're collectively doing it. And again, whole team, not just product team, but think about the other parts of the organization that can contribute to a sketch. Start to circle those gaps, right? Start thinking about where are these places that um, you have gaps and name a person. It may not be the person ultimately who's on it, maybe the head of the department, maybe the person who you know drives most of the conversation, but you have a person who you can then go to and say, hey, this is who's going to do it. Capture your gap data. So you probably already have data across your organizations that not everyone has access to. Start to gather and inventory that data. Start thinking about how you can share access to that data. I know some data and some organizations are a little more sensitive where you know, it's financial data, but give people the data they have to make the decisions that they need. And how you find that out is actually go talk to those people. Just say, hey, what could I give you that would help you do your job better, right? How can I help a customer service team? How can I help a marketing team? How can I help a sales team? Because that's actually going to inform the things you do next um, as you think about product work. Track those shift triggers. Look at the top five, top 10, top 15, whatever your number is, things that drive volume. What are the number one reason people are calling in for? What's the number one reason people are emailing about? What's the number one people are, people are um, texting about? Those drivers will probably indicate some shift triggers you want to start paying attention to. right? You might be able to aggregate those and find some trends. Look for, in your data, any activity that preceded a contact. right? If they went to the search box and said, contact us, phone number, customer service, or if they clicked on one of those contact links or they looked for a phone number, look at what activity immediately preceded that so you can start to identify some shift triggers. Fix the friction is tricky, right? because how much can you practically fix in your next sprint? Here's what I would like for you to think about. I want you to identify one gap, one gap that you can close in 30 days, right? It doesn't have to be software. It could be a new email template. It could be a new script in your IVR, right? The thing that your menu options have changed, you can change that. Think about one thing you all collectively as an organization can do to close one gap. And then the final step in closing the loop, pick a service team, doesn't matter which team, Grant them access to one of your product systems. So let's say you're instrumented um, for performance analytics. Let's say you've got new relic reports. Grant them access to that. Look at spikes and have them correlate some of that data. Because you might be able to solve a pain point by giving a team access to data that they did not otherwise have. So identify one team. You may want to pilot it. Maybe it's only three people that have access to it. But you might want to think about a way to grant people access to that data. So I want to leave you with this quote. Because if you think about um, what we talked about today, 
people will forget the moments and they will forget the interactions. But I certainly remember that hour I spent waiting for my fresh direct order. I certainly remember the eight hours I spent anxiously wondering if anything would happen with my bank account. Those are the moments. And this is an amazing quote um, about how people feel when they use your products because that is what makes great product experiences is if you can make people fall in love with your products. And so my information's up there. If we don't get to questions, certainly feel free to connect. Um, if you think of something or you have additional questions, I'm happy to chat uh, and I'll put the obligatory plug in. We are looking for PMs across our board. So if you're interested, come talk. Um, but I think it's Q&A time now, yeah? So yes. It is. So it, uh, it was not something that we fixed, or certainly when I was there. Um, and the reason it was complicated is rooted in the genesis of Weight Watchers. It was built as two separate companies. It was an online company and a meetings company. And so it was in two entirely different systems. Uh, what we did do, though, was we enabled the receptionist to be able to process that transfer in the moment. So even though someone couldn't um, rebuy the right thing, the receptionist could make it seamless to them, right? So it was a behind the curtain solution from a user perspective, but there was a lot of like cancel the order, reprocess the order behind the scenes and reissue the order that was happening. Um, and it was not without friction, but yeah, that's how we um, tried to tackle that problem. At General Assembly, so kind of going back to that Maya Angelou quote, if yeah. so much is about how you make the person feel at the end and that's what they remember, how do you quality control for that when it is like an education platform and so much is in person? So there's a number of things we do. Um, we have both digital tools that are part of the education and there's a classroom experience. So we have um, our instructors all report to instructor managers and instructor managers do observations and they all work together to create a unified rubric to say, you know, what is the quality of the instructional experience? So that's one. Um, we ha are introducing assessments, which lets us empirically measure, right? How much are people learning? Um, and the measure of learning, which then translates into their ability to be successful in the jobs that they ultimately get. Um, and the third thing is, you know, we have um, surveys that we introduce at three points throughout the experience. And so or three points for the long form courses are immersive programs um, and then two for the part time courses. But those surveys give us both qualitative scoring as well as uh, qualitative data as well as quantitative scoring on what things we need to work on. And, Sometimes it's about the class, and sometimes, I won't lie, it's about the coffee, right? It's like, the coffee machine's not working, or the quality of the coffee is not very good. Uh, but it's definitely a good first indicator for us to see. And it's really interesting when we can see, you know, so we're a network of um, 17 plus locations, and so we can identify patterns that are regional versus patterns that might be systemic, right? When we say, you know, if um, a new front end framework has come up. So when uh, Facebook introduced React, for example, we started to get a little bit of inquiry about when we were going to introduce React into the curriculum. And so based on that, we said, hey, there's enough demand. And we knew it was important enough that we were able to then introduce that. So oh, there's a question somewhere here. Yeah. Uh, I may have uh, missed it, but after aggregating all your uh, data and like looking at it through Snowplow, um, what's the kind of uh, questions uh, you should, should you have your um, Data, uh, data people like uh, asking or looking at or uh, prompting the company to be thinking about. Because um, uh, my current company, uh, we aggregate everything through uh, through this tool called Segment and just aggregates all our data. We have data, but uh, I don't think we're really asking the right questions as far as um, what really matters. Yeah. So I think it's a good. It's a good. It's a good question and a good problem to have, right? If you've got a ton of data, how do you derive insight from this mountain of data? Um, so I think two-part answer. One part is, do you have the right people looking at the data to mine it for insights? Because it's a particular skill set, right? So you could, you could stare at the data and say, like, how do I draw correlations uh, and draw causal links? Um, but the second part is, I think, just thinking about looking at things not in single moments. The benefit of having everything linked together is being able to follow something through 
um, an entire journey, right? So from purchase to use to consumption to a trip, if it's happening, right? If your um, customer's dropping off for whatever reason, if they're cycling back in, is that same person coming back in? What is their tenure and what are they doing in that tenure? Um, we've seen patterns uh, at Weight Watchers in how much people engage in using the app um, versus when they actually say they are done with their program, right? Uh, there's some patterns that emerge with correlation of success on program and actual weight loss to re-engagement and reuse. And so you can look for those patterns, but I think longitudinal view is probably one of the best things you can get from looking at this data. Um, you mentioned before that um, the user sees every channel um, kind of as, as part of the same brand, um, regardless of who's VP of this, who's you know AP of that. So I'm wondering if you can talk at all about, with regards to reducing mode shift friction consensus building, and how that relates to that, especially if you have a larger organization. Mm -hmm. So there's two things, and it's always challenging when you're trying to influence outside of your domain of control. Uh, and that's why I think data is tremendously important, right? So two things. One, being able to make the case that this friction is actually costing the company something, right? It may be costing the company um, support costs in the number of calls that we have to deal with. It may be costing the company, if you're tracking um, K-factor, like recommendations, what are people saying uh, about your product experience outside of the walls of your company? Um, and then I think the other thing is building the relationship, right? So if um, the people you're working with, so for example, if you have a sales team that you're partnering with and you're saying, hey, I need you to make some changes to your CRM system, and if you do that out of the blue, you're probably going to have less success than if you've built this relationship over time and they say, hey, here's some stuff that we need, here's some data that we're looking for, can you provide it for us? Um, or here's some tooling that we need, uh, can you do that? And I think as you start to build that rapport, you're going to have a better likelihood of um, influencing them and influencing the work because as I'm sure you all know, there is a finite set of resources uh, and always infinitely more requested work on each of those teams um, as us too. So yeah, so I think that's the way you think about approaching that. Thank you. Sure. Back here? Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you know, when you're talking about channels and methods of communication, your user doesn't necessarily care. Um, they're interacting more with with your brand, not necessarily any given team. Uh, in my case, my uh, product team actually works on, on internal tooling. So our primary customers are actually fellow employees. Um, would you care to talk a little bit about maybe, you know, in, in our instance, they know us personally. You know, they can come throw things over the wall at us. So would you have any advice on how to kind of create that kind of brand experience where, um, you know, that, that kind of wall may not actually necessarily exist? So I think the same principles apply, right? So if you think about um, their relationship, your customer in this case is an internal customer and their mechanism of communication with you um, may be through like, hey, pop by, look over the wall and sort of talk about something. It may be a Slack message that they're sending you. It may be a ticket that they're opening. And how you respond to that um, is part of that experience and how you communicate. It's something that we deal with. Uh, internal teams in particular tend to get like the brunt of the like, everybody's got a request for me and not everyone's going to get what they want. Everybody gets one tenth of what they're looking for. And how you are responding to that to say, these are the things we're going to work on. These are the priorities, right? So think about those customers as an end user and think about what friction might exist in that journey for them. They're like, hey, I've got this quick thing I need you to do. It's always a quick thing they need you to do. Uh, and inevitably, it's a complicated thing. And so what things can you create between those relationships to say, hey, here, let me show you some data, right? Like you and your team have asked for 500 things this year, and we've worked on 50 for you, right? And that's data they can use and say, hey, OK, this is great. Or if they're putting in requests to you, how well qualified are those requests, right? Did they give you all the information you need? Your ticket, on average, requires seven back and forths before we actually get to starting the work, right? And that's data that you can use to say, Let's make this interaction better for both of us. Uh, so that's a way to think about mode shift friction, even with an internal consumer base. So, yeah. Yes. Um, OK. Uh, so in my case, I'm a little bit different, I guess, than people in this room. But we're in the midst of launching our product. Um, and in healthcare, which is obviously the industry that I'm in, and I'm sure in wellness as well, when it comes to Weight Watchers, onboarding initially in personal information can be a fun Daunting. point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you have any 
tips regarding, you know, how maybe to minimize that friction, whether it's maybe an email before or something or what in person, maybe on board, whatever it is, how to approach that process to kind of make that friction smaller. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you one thing we tried, which may be applicable. So one of the um, teams at Weight Watchers was focused on relationships with major insurers. Uh, and basically, if you have a health plan and they offer a benefit, you as a member can plug in your member information and you know the litany of information they ask for um, to get that. And so one of the ways we attempted to solve for, ask, instead of asking for that, was to sort of pre-streamline um, the, the process. And so what we would do is we'd say, you know, who is your, are you covered by insurance? Yes or no. Who is your insurance provider? And then whittle down the list of um, validation that we might do on member IDs, right? So that when they're entering their member ID, there's less opportunity for uh, failure. I think the other thing you can do is to the extent possible, and the insurers we were working with were comfortable with this, but if you can transport data, the more you can have passive data entry as opposed to active data entry. Say, I give you my member number and another identifier, and I can validate some information, and I'm in as opposed to giving you the full HIPAA-compliant medical record. Um, so I think those are two ways you can think about approaching it. I think in regulated industries like healthcare, uh, certainly in education, I think there's certain constraints that are going to be placed, and I think maybe thinking about um, alternative ways. So the experience of signing up might be through a web interface, but perhaps there's something that you could be doing at the doctor's office to say, like, here's a way you can get a head start on some of this, right? So maybe thinking um, orthogonally about how you might solve getting them onboarded and then getting them using it. So maybe a couple of ways you can try to think about solving for friction there. Other questions? Yes. So you talked about, um you know, combining qualitative and quantitative measures of friction or, or user pain. When looking at things that can be a big pain but don't happen at a very high frequency, um, you know, how do you get a, an honest read on that, especially when maybe some of that feedback or the qualitative stuff can be coming from your, you know, loudest or most invested users? Yeah, so I think um, qualitative on its own is hard, right, because it, it will certainly bias for the noise, right, and the bias for the complaint. I think you have to have some kind of quantifying measure on it. I think the quantifying measure isn't necessarily to define scope, but maybe to help justify the cost implication. So for example, if your noisiest complaint by qualitative rating is driving a super long call handle time, right, but there's only 10 of so of those calls a month, where the next one down maybe you get 50,000 calls of them, but they generally resolve in 30 seconds, right? You might look at that total time spent by a customer service agent as X, and the cost of fixing the solution is actually better spent on solving for that like edge case problem that so many people are complaining about versus the, uh, the one complaint that shows up. If you look at any um, forced ranked list of metrics, the thing that would have the highest volume, the 50,000 calls, is going to be the thing people complain about the most. Uh, but there may actually be a cost benefit in solving the less important problems. I think that's one way to think about it. I think the other thing is you want to try to um, get to a sample size enough with qualitative that you, you're sure that your data isn't like overly biased in one space, right? So if you get 10 complaints about something, that's probably not enough of a sample size um, for you to draw any meaningful conclusions. And it may be an opportunity then to get a research team to start to do a little bit more generative research and say, hey, what, what should we be looking at here? The problem may be manifest as the complaint, but it may actually be an underlying problem that's a different one. And so, so I think deploying a research tool uh, to widen the scope of the uh, qualitative data that you have to make sure you get, that, get to that would be um, a good way to think about it. Who's going to do one of these things tomorrow? Nobody. Next sprint? A few more hands. Next year? Maybe? Yeah? All right. 2019 project, right? We're done with our roadmap for the year. We can't touch it. All right. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Sharon. I think when I said last question, that probably just froze everybody. It's just the pressure. <laughs> Um, so one thing that we do at Products That Count is we do this 
10 seconds of fame for any of you who want to share. So we do shout outs. Um, if you are looking for work or if you have a job that you are looking to fill, a gig that you want to share, um, a product that you want users to use, uh, this is your 10 seconds. So think about it. If you want to share anything, I would just say line up over here. And then while we do that, um, there's two things that I want to just quickly talk about. So one, obviously feedback is very important to all of us product people. So it's important to products that count. So at the very end, uh, you'll probably, you, ha you would have received it already, but later on tonight, if you haven't, there will be an email with a link to a very short survey. Please take it. It really helps us. It's, it's really not throwaway. It helps us quite a big deal. We take it seriously. We want to improve our programs. So do take it. And um, uh, it will also help our speakers get better. So we will share it with Sheeran. I'm sure you did amazing. It's basically an NPS survey. And you know, on average, 50 is, is, um, is what we do, which is a really, really good score. And so it becomes even a game for our speakers to try to beat each other. So. Let's try to give uh, Shira that, um, that winning streak. All right, yes, exactly. Um, and then next month, so February 21st is our next talk. We are hosting the former VP of product from the Huffington Post, Julia Beiser. She will be talking about uh, driving innovation in real news, not fake news people, real news. So do come, it's very exciting. Uh, we're, we're very excited to have her. All right, I see here that we have a cute little line. All right, Chris, why don't you start? Oh boy, um, I'm Chris Britt and I'm a product manager and I'm just finishing a six month contract uh, with Bloomingdale's and their lean uh, labs doing e-commerce. So um, yeah, if anybody's looking for product managers, hit me up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ron Ondeko. I'm the director of product at One Kings Lane. Andrea is actually my boss, uh, who runs e-commerce there. Uh, I'm actively recruiting for a technical project manager as well as a product manager uh, for the e-commerce space. So if anybody's interested, certainly send them my way or come stop by and talk to me. Thanks. Hi, I'm Nick. I'm a product manager at Shapeways, our platform bringing 3D printing to consumers and the general population. It's a pretty exciting industry, certainly no boring problems. Um, we're actively hiring for a senior product manager and product designers. So if you're interested in those opportunities, come see me. Hi, I'm Tara Goldman. I work at General Assembly with Sheeran, and I'm director of product. We also have two roles open, one for a growth product manager and one for a technical product manager. So if you're interested, come chat. Hi, I'm Rose, um, and I'm founder of Life Share Care. As you may have heard, um, we are midst launched. Uh, so if you guys are looking for a side gig, um, we are currently trying to fix up, I guess, some of our UX. Um, we are a verification platform for home care agencies. So we ensure that your grandparents who are being cared for in the home are actually being cared for. And with that, we bring a whole slew of transparency to a industry that has currently been opaque. Thanks. Hi, my name is King Krumpicha, and I am here with Etienne. That's my amazing product team. I represent the HR department. So we are a healthcare tech company solving a huge problem with um, data through analytics and building a good, uh, robust platform. We are always looking to talk to amazing and um, passionate uh, individuals in this space. So uh, feel free to come talk to me if, uh, if you have any questions, um, specifically product and engineering. Well, that is all we had tonight, guys. So subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't. Thanks again to Digital Ocean for this awesome space. We still have pizza, we still have beer, we still have wine, um, but we do recycle. Make sure let's keep this place clean. Thank you so much, and please come again next month.